Hey guys, welcome back. In this module, we're talking all about um, parenting. So mostly mother and infant relationships or mother and infant bonds. But I think it's really important that we take a step back and talk about two concepts before we go any further. So those concepts that are really important, I think, to sort of pause at now are the concepts of reciprocal altruism and alloparenting. Um, so as you've probably noticed with this course as we move along, is that all of these concepts do sort of tie together. Kinship, um, ecology, dominance, um, all of those things kind of play a role. And so these two um, topics it sort of don't have a neat spot to fit into, but I'm going to put them in now because we're talking more about maternal roles, and I think these do kind of play a pretty significant role in female relationships. So that's why we're going to do them here. So the first thing I'm going to talk about, and it might seem a little bit off topic, but as we come back to everything that we're talking about, you'll see how it really kind of plays a role in a lot of what's going on. Um, and that's the concept of reciprocal altruism. So what is altruism? What does it mean to be altruistic? So we might think of somebody who is philanthropic as altruistic. So being altruistic means that you are doing something for somebody without an immediate return. Okay. Um, and we do that a lot in society and it's not just people who are giving generous gifts to charity. Um, it could be in your daily lives, right? Like you and your friends, not so much now, <laughs> but during normal times might go and go to Tim Hortons. Okay. And you might be short on cash and your friend says, don't worry, I got it. She's not expecting you he or she's not necessarily expecting you to show up the next day with the $2 that the coffee costs because at some point in time, they know that they're going to be able to rely on you for something they need. So the concept of reciprocal altruism is really important in social species. So it's really important for humans. We do this all the time. And it's really important for primates and other animals as well. The concept that you would decrease your fitness, right? You would give up a resource that is important to you for your fitness to assist another individual without the expectation of an immediate return. So that's the actual theory. I'm actually going to pause here briefly so that I can read the true theory for you guys. There's some specific things that need to happen. Um, and the reason I'm going for the, these direct words is because I want you guys to understand them and hint, know them. Okay. So there's some things that need to happen for us to say that something is reciprocal altruism, okay? So the first thing that needs to happen is that the behavior must reduce the donor's fitness relative to a selfish alternative. What does that mean? Let's unpack that. Okay, so as the donor of the behavior... I am doing something for you. It could be I'm buying your coffee for you. It could be I'm babysitting your child. It could be um, I'm dropping off soup because you don't feel well. It, it could be any number of things, right? And it's reducing my fitness. I'm giving you food that I could be eating. I'm giving your child care that I could be, you know, saving for my own. I'm doing something that's going to reduce my fitness relative to being selfish. So in terms of inclusive fitness, right, it's always in theory better to be selfish, right? Because you're, you're ensuring the survival of your own DNA. So in this, it seems counterintuitive. We're doing a behavior that reduces our fitness. Okay. The second thing that we need to see is that the fitness of the recipient is elevated, okay? So I've done something for you. It's cost me something, 
and you gained from it. So the fitness of the recipient must be elevated. Number two. So number one, the behavior must reduce the donor's fitness. Number two, the recipient, the fitness of the recipient must be elevated. Okay. So it's important that you got something that was beneficial to you out of it, right? <laughs> because if I dropped off a bunch of stinky fish heads to your house that you're never going to eat, that didn't help you at all. <laughs> so that's a, a silly example. But again, understand that I've done something that's reduced my fitness and increased your fitness. Okay. So here's the other important thing. The performance of the behavior must not, I repeat, must not depend on immediate return. Okay. So I've done this thing for you. There must not be an immediate response from you to give something back. Okay. We call that a tit for tat. Okay. This is not a tit for tat. Okay. A tit for tat would be, um, I'm giving you my sandwich and you're giving me your cupcakes. We both got something out of it. It could be that I see that you're hungry and you don't have food, so I gave you half of my sandwich. Okay? It would have been better for me to keep the whole thing and eat it, but I gave it to you to help you. Okay? You don't have anything in that moment to give me in return. Okay? So again, I'm going to harp on these three because I would imagine there's an exam coming up. We might see this. Okay? The behavior must reduce the donor's fitness relative to a selfish alternative. The fitness of the recipient must be elevated, okay? And the performance of the behavior must not depend on the receipt of an immediate benefit in return, okay? So, now, this is hugely important in social, in social structures, okay? If we don't do this, Okay, if we don't participate in a reciprocal altruism, this kind of doesn't, society doesn't work. Okay, so I'm going to tell you two other conditions. Okay, so the first three are the things that we must observe to say that reciprocal altruism is happening. Okay, we can observe all three of those things. We can say, yes, this social group is performing reciprocal altruism. But there's two things, two conditions necessary for it to develop, okay? There must be a mechanism for detecting cheaters, okay? Again, these are the two conditions necessary for reciprocal altruism to evolve in a society. The first is we must have a mechanism for detecting cheaters, okay? What does that mean? People who cheat the system. Okay. So this is the example I've always used. So I'm just going to go ahead and use it and assume that at some point when you guys are listening to it, we're going to be going out to bars again. <laughs> so you go to a bar with a group of your friends every Thursday night. It's pretty consistent. There's a group of you guys that go out, right? There's that one person in the group who never seems to buy around. We'll call him Joe. And if your name is Joe, I apologize. So Joe goes out and week one, everybody's buying a round of drinks. Everybody's having a great time. Joe's like, oh, well, you know, I didn't get paid this week. Oh, you know, I got you guys next week. Next week rolls around. Everybody buys a round of drinks. Joe somehow is like always in the bathroom or he's just not there, right? He doesn't buy a round of drinks. Eventually, you guys are going to be like, Joe's never buying any drinks. What the hell's up with that, Right? you're going to detect that he is cheating the system, right? So either you're not going to invite him anymore or you're not going to buy him a drink when it's time to buy a round or something may happen, right? You're going to know that he's cheating, okay? Um, it's just like if you've always helped, you know, you help your friend to move. Nobody likes to help their friend move. It's not an enjoyable situation. But when you move, you expect your friend to help you back right? If your friend makes excuses for not helping you move, that friend is cheating, right? You're going to feel that you're going to know that, right? So it's not necessarily something that we immediately recognize, 
but we do have an internal mechanism for detecting cheaters. Okay, so that's one of the conditions that we need for it to evolve. So we need to know if somebody's cheating. The second one is that we need a large or indefinite number of opportunities to exchange aid. A large or indefinite number of opportunities to exchange aid. So that means we need to actually live in a social group. If you're a hermit or you're, you know, you're living by yourself or only in a monogamous pair, you don't have a lot of opportunity to exchange aid. Okay, so we need to have a social group that's functioning in a way that we can exchange aid consistently back and forth. Okay, so those are the two conditions that we need for it to develop. So I'm going to drop into your um, module here a little um, diagram. So if you want to pause me and pull that up or however you guys want to do that, if you just want to listen to me talk about it first. Um, and then you can look at it. So there's a nice little flow chart in this diagram that kind of describes how this happens. So the first thing is that I'm assuming that I'm receiving aid from you, my student, okay? I receive aid from you. I notice that you've done this favor for me and I feel happy about it, right? So that's important. I have to notice that you did it. If I don't know you've done this for me, it kind of defeats the point. So you've done a favor for me, I notice it and I feel happy about it, okay? So the, in the first scenario, I feel obligated to do you a favor or I like you and I wanna do you a favor, right? So I reciprocate at some point in the future. That leads you to like me and we have positive reinforcement and we continue to give each other aid, okay? In the other scenario, I've still received aid from you or a favor. I've noticed it and I liked it. So all of those things are still the same. But in that case, I'm kind of a jerk. I don't feel obligated to do you a favor and I don't want to, okay? So I don't reciprocate. So you notice that I'm cheating and I'm not really participating in reciprocation. That means you don't like me, okay? That means you're very unlikely to do me any favors in the future, okay? So those are all really important things. So go ahead and grab that flow chart. It, it just breaks that out into exactly what I just said, um, but it's a good flow. So that is what reciprocal altruism is. And the next topic I'm gonna talk about is alloparenting. And you'll see that reciprocal altruism plays a huge role in that. But you'll also notice as we move past exam two into things like social learning and tool use and all of that, reciprocal altruism is kind of an underlying concept that's happening, okay? Because we can't really have a social society without being able to give aid and not expecting a tit for tat. Okay, so the next thing I'm gonna jump into is the concept of alloparenting. So what the heck is alloparenting? So the literal de definition, let me make sure I have it, is boop, 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 parental care provided by an individual towards a non-descendant young. What the heck does that mean? Parental care given to a dependent that is a non-descendant young. So anyone other than mom or dad, okay? An alloparent can be anyone other than mom or dad, okay? Because the mom and dad are, the, the child is the direct descendant of mom and dad. So siblings, aunts, grandmas, it's usually females in this case, can be an, al um, an alloparent, okay? So this is really important. We just talked about um, social structures. We talked about dominant structures. We talked about mating um, strategies. So the ability in a social group to care for young is really, really important, right? Because again, it helps our fitness to care for young. It even goes back to ecology. It goes back to taxonomy where our infants have markedly different coat colors, okay? So the concept of alloparenting is really important, okay? So an alloparent can be anyone who is not a descendant. So what are some ways that an allo parent 
might participate in the support of um, Young. So the first way, and again, these are going to be really scientific definitions, so I'll say the definition and then I'll break it down. So the first way that we can alloparent is preparing um, for the offspring prior to zygomatic or zygotic development. Okay, what the heck does that mean? It means nest building or territory defense, right? We're preparing for the arrival of the offspring while they're still in utero. Okay, so we're helping the mother either literally build nests or a den or, again, it's not just primates that do it, or we're helping to establish a defendable territory. Okay, so that's one way in which we alloparent. Another way is direct provisioning of food for the young, okay? Direct provisioning of food for the young. And that's literally helping to bring food, either to the mother who is nursing, right? Because the more nourishment that she has, um, the better she's able to produce milk, right, for her offspring. And the third is tending to caring for, feeding, defending, teaching, truly babysitting, right? That's what we think of when we think of babysitting, all of those things, tending to, hold on, tending to, caring for, feeding, defending, and teaching, okay? So the type three is preparing for offspring prior to zygotic development. Two is direct provisioning of food for the young. And three is tending to, caring for, feeding, defending, and teaching the young, okay? So those are all really, really important things, right? Those are all things that the mother might need help with. Um, and they're really important things for the infant to get right. If the infant, and we're going to talk about attachments, has secure attachments to its mother, the ability to have a lot of additional kin around that it can learn from is really valuable, right? So whether it's having a sibling that's a little bit older, a little bit more gregarious, a little bit more adventurous around to follow, right, and to learn things from, um, I think all of us that have older siblings did that when we were growing up, having grandmothers and aunts around, uh, all of those things help us learn in a social environment. And when we talk about social learning, again, we'll see that that's really, really important to have others in your social group that can alloparent you. Not only as the offspring, right, because you get a lot from that, but also as the mother, right, because additional support is always great. And again, we're going to see a lot more alloparenting happening with those that are more directly related. Again, a stronger kinship relation is going to go hand in hand with the frequency of alloparenting. Okay? Um, so, some things that you guys might want to be aware of is that it is possible to have some downsides, right? Um, so the benefits to the offspring we talked about, let's talk about the benefits to the aloe parent really quick. So we, we know why clearly it's going to be a great thing for the offspring. But why is it a good idea for the, an aloe parent to invest in an infant that isn't their own? Okay, so some of the reasons that it's a benefit to, to the allo parent is that there's an indif indirect fitness gain, right? Again, this typically happens among closer kin. So they're still going to, that infant is still going to share a percentage of your DNA. You're going to get parental experience, right? It's so important for young female monkeys, juvenile female monkeys, to get experience babysitting, right? Because that gives them the practice that they're going to need when they become mothers. There's the possibility that it can help increase their social rank. Now, I know when we talked about dominance, we talked about the social hierarchies. But when you get ranks that are very, very similar in um, relation, especially, I mean, not super, super high up because those are a little bit more stringent. But when you get towards the middle of the pack and you have um, rankings that are very close to each other, there is the possibility for some movement, right? So if you are consistently giving aid to a high-ranking mother, she might help support you, right, in a squirmish because she knows that you're a great babysitter. Um, it gives the opportunity for extra pair greetings or 
breedings, sorry, um, and the um, acquisition of mates, right? So if you're allo parenting and you are in the middle of the group, in the middle of the females, right? Those mothers at a certain point are going to be busy when those males come around. It's going to put you in a position to potentially um, get more mating opportunities. Um, and the same thing for males. Males don't do a lot of allo parenting, but we do see, especially some of the newer males or novel males in a group, might do a little bit of tending to infants. Um, as a way to help woo the mothers. Um, it's going to give you um, protection from predation during cooperative breeding, right? So if you are helping to alloparent, you will, your infants will also be alloparenting, right? More eyes on all of the infants in general. Um, and in the instance of like our marmosets and tamarins, we talked about how those juveniles might stay behind at the nest and help um, raise their siblings. And when they do that, their parents support them in gaining territory, right? So those are all benefits to the allo parent, okay? Um, so again, we talked about the benefits to the young. We talked about the benefits to the allo parent. There can be some costs. So what are some costs to the young? So one cost might be that you might get a bad babysitter, right? Your babysitter might just be really crummy and they might hurt you or endanger you in some way. Um, and that's not great, right? They might mistreat you. They might hurt you. They might endanger you. Um, and a male might use you in what we call agonistic buffering. A-G-O-N-I-S-T-I-C. Agonistic buffering. So I think we might have seen this in the Gelada Baboon video, okay? But I'm going to describe ag agonistic buffering to you, so you guys should recall seeing something like this. Um, a male might use an infant as a shield because typically that will um, diffuse aggression, okay? So if a male is in an aggressive situation and they want to diffuse it, they might grab an infant and use it as a buffer, we call that an agonistic buffer, okay? Because we are buffering that antagonism, right? So typically it diffuses the aggression, but not always. So you could get hurt. You could get hurt from a bad babysitter. You could get hurt from an agonistic buffer. And then, of course, there's a cost to the alloparent in general, you know, Anything, any energy you expend on an infant that is not your own is energy lost, right? But the reason for this, again, we're going to talk about reciprocal altruism, is that at the end of the day or when it all kind of hashes out, everybody receives an equal amount of care in return so that it makes sense to sort of spread out your care and to offer assistance to infants that are closely related to you. Okay, I hope that makes sense. So um, let's talk about some ways that we might see this. Just scrolling through my notes because I have a ton of notes on this. Oh, goodness gracious. Um, give me one moment. Okay, so these are called mutualistic, right? because both parties mutually get a benefit out of this. So there's cooperative breeding. So in the cooperative breeding system, um, this is where siblings may stay behind. Okay, we call that cooperative breeding. A sibling stays behind at the nest. It can be primates. We see that in um, marmosets and tamarins. We might also consider that our black -back male gorillas um, we sometimes see this in other species like African wild dogs and some birds. Um, so what will happen is that those helpers at the nest is what we call them. They are offspring that are technically sexually mature and should be off creating their own offspring. But they've stayed behind to help their parents with the next generation. And by doing this, They've ensured that their parents will support them 
when it is time for them to establish their own territory. So they stay behind briefly. They repress their reproduction. Again, that's a big deal if our goal is to spread as much of our genes as possible. So for a period of time, they repress that so that they can stay behind and assist their siblings. And then their parents will help them establish a territory. Okay. Then we have what we call joint brood care or babysitting. Okay, so we see this in vervets, ring-tailed lemurs, macaques, a lot of primate species. Um, and this is where we'll, we'll truly see like community care. Okay, so we'll see, um, you know, a mother and like her sisters and multiple offspring, like all kind of together, babysitting, caring for, you might see like juvenile females helping with the infants so it really does truly look like a you know it takes a village it's a communal experience everybody is helping each other and babies are wildly attractive okay there's a reason that infants look the way they do um so think about every infant that you see a human infant a monkey infant a puppy a kitten right there's characteristics about them they have big foreheads, they have big eyes, they usually have floppy ears. There's something about that that evokes the oh, response, right? That's important. They're designed biologically to make you think they're cute. It makes you want to care for them. So infants are wildly attractive particularly to other females and especially to juvenile females who haven't quite yet bred <laughs> because once you become a mom you know it's kind of a pain in the butt but you've got all of these little sisters that are, are big sisters that are ready to help cousins and things like that so again reciprocal altruism revolves around the idea that we're all going to help each other now there was one more and I'm I'm scrolling through my notes and I'm just going to explain it to you and don't worry because I'm not going to ask you to tell me what this is called. Where is the clock retreating? Okay. Uh, hoofstock, like zebras, um, gazelles, wildebeest, things like that, that have um, lots of predators will participate in sort of this, and I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but don't worry, this one's not on the exam, but I think it is important to know. Um, they cooperate in a behavior where they keep all of the young in the center of the herd. Um, and they kind of, um, the whole outside of the herd is typically um, the adults. And this helps to protect or insulate. So that's another example of allo care or allo parenting. So those are all mutualistic because they help everybody, right? At the end of the day, everybody's sort of getting the help that they need because everybody's participating and reciprocating. There are some examples of parasitic. So a really great example is, and go ahead and Google this. Go ahead and Google Reed Warbler. So Reed is R-E-E-D. Warbler is spelled W-A-R-B-L-E-R. -E and you should at some point get a photo of a reed warbler feeding a cuckoo bird. So a reed warbler, a little, little bitty bird like this, okay? Um, and they live in marshy areas. What'll happen in these areas is that a cuckoo will come in, push all of the warbler's eggs out of the nests, so kill all of the um, warblers, and lay her eggs in the nest, and then disappear. When the eggs hatch, the warbler takes care of them because she assumes that they're her infants. But the cuckoo bird is like, even the infant is like this big compared to the itty bitty warbler. So you'll see this picture where you've got this adult warbler feeding this humongous baby. Well, obviously that is parasitic, right? That's terrible. That mother is not doing anything to increase her fitness. And she's expending a tremendous amount of energy on an infant that has, is not genetically related to her. Okay. So 
those are the two concepts I wanted to talk about um, that sort of kind of fit in this area a little bit. But again, it's going to be something that you should think about across all of the topics that we've discussed. Um, because in order to form a social structure and have larger social groups, things like reciprocal altruism and alloparenting um, and cooperative breeding are super important to, for the sustainability of those societies. Okay. Um, as always, if you guys have any questions, please drop them in an email to me. Um, and we have exam two coming up real soon. So make sure you know this, this stuff, I guarantee you will be on that exam.